here's where I want to start. Um, talk about what the context was uh, for this killing, who Budson and Nevers were, what department they were part of, and what was going on uh, between Detroit police and Detroiters uh, when they killed Malice Green. Well, it's interesting. The context is, is very interesting because as you will recall, and most people will recall, that at this, this was right on the heels of the Rodney King verdict in California. Yes. yes. Uh, and I always tell people that in that case, uh, in our case anyway, there was no video. It wasn't, we did it the old fashioned way with witnesses that were there who testified. But as, as, as you know, it was, it was right kind of at the, at the precipice of all the unrest that they were having in LA. And um, there was not only the acquittal of the officers that, that, that beat um, Rodney King, but also the riots were going on in LA and everywhere else. And there was Reginald Denny, he was pulled out of a, a truck when he was working and, and he was beaten. And it was just a terrible thing that was going on. And quite frankly, I, I knew that the case was going on. I knew that there had been an acquittal. I knew that it had been moved to Simi Valley as opposed to staying in downtown LA, which I will never understand that decision, but that's not for me to understand, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, I was, you know, not oblivious, but I was, I was doing my cases and I was working on a case or I was already in trial in a case where a very elderly woman had been robbed and pushed down by two males and she died. And so I was really ensconced in that case, trying it. And uh, I was summoned to Mr. Mr. O'Hare's office, who was the prosecutor at the time, my boss. I was still an assistant back then, obviously. And he asked me to um, be one of the prosecutors trying this case. And um, but I'm in another case, and so <laughs> kind of had to do it simultaneously. So we put together a team of prosecutors to decide what the charges were going to be. I was a part of that team, um, uh, working on that by night and by day, trying my case. And uh, we made that charging decision. And back then, you know, that was not a popular decision for, for John O'Hare. And as you know, he barely squeaked by a re-election, his next election cycle, mainly because of this case, because he did... Um, just very, very quickly, um, as he would want us to do, to do the right thing. And it didn't matter what the fallout was going to be. He didn't put any pressure on us. He just told us to go and make the right decision. Yeah, yeah. Um, the right decision was was charging, obviously, in that case, charging homicide in that case. Um, there had never been at that time, and really even, to, well, I guess there has been today, but there had never at that time been um, a successful prosecution of on-duty police officers for murder. This had never happened and we were the first. And so that was kind of the climate that was going on um, at the time. And the, you know, I wouldn't say protests were sweeping the nation like happened with George Floyd and others, but it was a very heightened alert type situation. And I remember it was Coleman Young was the mayor then and he was kind of near the end of his tenure um, and was very interested in this case and said some things in his coleman <laughs> <laughs> kind of way that we had to deal with almost each and every time during the trial. And we certainly had to deal with it during jury selection. Yeah. And so, um, you know, getting a jury was difficult. It was a, a we did, did it the way that we do in Wayne County that many, many people had not heard of. We had a one jury for each defendant. Um, and then I always say, and I thought this was critical. So we didn't have the unrest that we had, that they had in LA. Don Barton, who was the owner of Barton Cablevision, mm -hmm. uh, made the decision, and I don't know how it happened, but made the decision that he was going to show this trial gavel to gavel mm -hmm. on free TV, yeah. whether you had Barton Cablevision or not. And that, to me, was a stroke of genius because I firmly believe, even if there had not been a conviction in this case, that Detroit wouldn't have gone up in flames mm -hmm. because people saw every single day us fighting really hard and honestly and earnestly. Not this was not a sham, this was not a sham prosecution. People saw that we were really trying to convict these officers for um, for murdering Mel Screen. Yeah. And they saw our they saw our witnesses, they saw everything that we did was on camera and on full display. Because remember at that time, Stephen, there was no court TV in Detroit at that time. Right. That's right. And so that was the only way that the citizens can, you can, uh, I, don't want, I want to say stream in, but that wasn't called that. You can turn on their TV and see it every day. Yeah. And um, I really think that that's what helped this city heal um, 
if we ever really heal, but heal at the time um, during that case. So I, I always think of kind of the irony of uh, one part of this that you mentioned, which was that, you know, Coleman Young was the mayor uh, uh, here, the first black mayor of the city elected in 1973, uh, on a platform of reforming police brutality, particularly against African Americans, uh, the stress units that were that were patrolling the city back in the '70s were were the reason uh, he said that we needed new leadership and a, and a different approach to the to the department. Um, you know, uh, 20 years later, almost, uh, we're, 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 it, it felt like we hadn't made the progress that uh, that his his election promised that. Yeah, it, it was very yeah. ironic. And I think it's not for lack of trying on his case, because remember at the right. time right. we had a black police chief. And remember, Coleman Young had had announced he wasn't running again. Um, Dennis yeah. Archer was running. And so he was, you know, he wasn't going to be the mayor anymore, but he was, you know, he was tuned into this case like no other. And I remember Bob Berg, who was, you know, one of the ones that worked very closely with him. Uh, younger people won't remember, but he was, he kept me really really um, posting on, you know, what the mayor thought. It didn't have anything to do with our case, obviously, because mm -hmm. uh, we were going to do the right thing, you know, no matter who the person was that wanted to inquire. <laughs> but um, it was it was just a different dynamic. And Detroit has always been different than any place else in the country. Um, and we've always had our own mindset, mindset, our own ways, our own, you know, kind of our own mores, our own traditions. <laughs> and and um, because they saw what what we were doing uh, people understood that we were trying to hold these officers accountable. And I lost friends, quote unquote friends, over this. I mean, you know, for, for the most part, the white police officers wouldn't talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them haven't talked to me, you know, 30 years, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of the black officers were split. Uh, very, very few thought that they should be charged with murder. There were a number, most of the well, a good number of black officers felt they should have been charged with manslaughter. They thought that murder was going too far, although it was when you pummel someone in the head with flashlights, I don't know what it is other than murder. Mm -hmm. um, and so and a lot of black officers never spoke to me again. I really think it's 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 a testament to the jurors who are on that case. Of course, when they were convicted, of course, people say, well, that's because it was a black jury. But then they they forget the rest of the story, that one jury was out eight days. And the other jury was out nine days. Mm -hmm. So this certainly wasn't a group of black folk rushing, rushing to judgment, just wanted to pin a murder on two white cops. They took eight and nine days because it's excruciating. If you talk to a to trial attorney, they will tell you one of the most excruciating, if not the most excruciating part of a trial is waiting for that verdict. And we had to wait for over a week <laughs> for both of them. And so they took everything seriously. They asked good questions. We had Judge George Crockett the third, who was a, a just a, a great jurist mm -hmm. who, you know, and I don't want to say he bent over back, he bent over backwards to make sure justice was done because that's what he did. He always made sure that justice was done. Uh, let's fast forward to Detroit of today. A and something really important, of course, happens between back then and now in terms of police reform in Detroit. And that's that, uh, you know, we have a consent agreement with the Justice Department to really clean up some of the the, the routine constitutional violations that have been going on for, for years and years uh, in Detroit. And I, I always point to that as uh, kind of the North Star for uh, understanding how the department functions now. It's not perfect. Uh, we still have uh, issues, but, but it is really different from uh, the department back then. But I wonder uh, from your chair as prosecutor, uh, and as the person who prosecuted these police officers 30 years ago, how differently the, the, the department looks now? Well, it is different. It's different in many ways. Um, first of all, it's a lot smaller than it was. You know, you know, there were a lot more people, you know, I, I didn't live in Detroit in its heyday when you had 2 million people and you had Black Bottom and you had, mm -hmm. oh, you know, it's, I wish I could have lived in Detroit back then. <laughs> Um, and so the department, I believe at the time we did, we did uh, the Guts and Nervous case, I believe it was like either 4,000, 4,500, at one point, 5,000 officers, but I don't think it was 5,000 officers when we did this case. And, you know, pretty, really large department. It's not in LA or New York, but a very mm -hmm. large department. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now I want to say there's under 2,800, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're less than half, I think, of what. Yeah. But, what of, but of course, we have, you know, probably we have a lot less people too. Mm -hmm. And so in Detroit, and so 
you know, just different, you know, we've had, I believe it's nine different changes of leadership since then in terms of chiefs of police, maybe 10, maybe more, which each new chief has their own agenda, his or her, because we've had one female, has their own agenda, um, their own, when I say own agenda, I don't mean that in a bad way, but different focuses that they want to they wanna focus on, um, different things they want to focus on. And it's been kind of a, a different road every time we get a new chief. Um, uh, my favorite is the chief we have now. I think he's uh, wonderful. He's, 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 we don't always agree, obviously. You don't always agree with anybody, but he is dedicated. He doesn't have an agenda. He's not looking for a stepping stone to go someplace else. He wants the, the department to run properly um, and is, will own up to mistakes. Mm. Um, wants to correct things that are wrong. And I just, I, 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 it's a very good relationship in terms of seeing someone who has the eye on doing right and wanting the officers to do things right. It hasn't always been like that. All we want to do here at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office is, is, is deliver justice. It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you, ha you have, what your ethnicity is, what your occupation is. We want to do right. At least that's what we strive for. We're not afraid to uh, bring charges against officers for varying reasons. You know, people get mad at us when we don't bring charges, but we, we are not going to put a case into the system to the best of our ability um, if we can't prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt, even though the public may think that that person is guilty as hell. Yeah. So, so, so you had a recent case where yeah. I think, you know, people were a little upset about yeah. you not filing charges in the Porter Burks case, uh, yeah. shot many times by officers, uh, a guy with mental health problems yep. he he did have a knife but 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 talk about the i guess the contrast between that decision well, and and well, you know, it's, we Green. can't we can't charge what we can't prove the uh, the standard for a criminal case is very very high it's not the standard is not we think he's guilty the standard is, is not the, the officer shouldn't have done what they did the standard is not you know well they're guilty minimally or the standard is not they're guilty but we can't prove it and so the releases we send out, I don't know, sometimes people don't read that, I'm sure, but we could not prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. There were witnesses, independent witnesses on the scene that said to us during our investigation, more than one, that the police did everything that they could to de-escalate that situation. And when he charged at them and covered all that space in a matter of less than three seconds with that knife, knowing the history that this young man had, um, there was really no other no, no other option that we can come up with. We can't prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a very clear self-defense defense of other cases. And, you know, it's a lot that people don't understand, but we are not going to, we're going to take the hit. If we don't think we can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt, then we're not going to charge it. We have other cases that we have charged. Um, many other police officers that we have charged. And there were a certain segment, a different segment of people that were unhappy with us then. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when I first became the prosecutor, trying to repair the relationships between uh, myself and some of the outside kind of departments outside the city of Detroit. Um, Detroiters loved me for the most part. <laughs> the the suburbs hated me for the most part. Kind of the opposite when I when I prosecuted the former mayor. Mm -hmm. Detroiters hated me. <laughs> the, the, you know, so it's just about you can't. This is you know you you don't go by the court of public opinion. You go by justice. You go by the evidence. You go by the facts. And sometimes people are not going to like your decisions but that's just the way it is and unfortunately we always 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 try to do the right thing yeah uh, and then when so, they, yeah go ahead. so so i want to talk just a little about you and the difference between you then and now uh this is how you become a a, a huge public figure here uh, in in detroit uh you become a judge after that and then mm -hmm. uh become the prosecutor uh it, it, do you do you feel like this was the defining moment uh, in the trajectory of your, your career, prosecuting Buds and Endeavors? I'm not sure it's the defining moment. It's certainly a very important moment. It's, it's work that I'm proud of. There's still people that are mad about it, you know, 30 years later. Um, <laughs> but it's something I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of the fact that John O'Hare allowed us to, not allowed us to charge, but allowed us to make the decision and without any kind of influence over us that he was willing to took the political hit and boy, did he take that political hit. Um, and that really shaped me into the prosecutor I am today because I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be someone who made decisions based on the, the, the law and the facts. And it sounds so trite, but that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to worry about, you know, people coming to my house. And this has happened in many cases, a couple of occasions, 
uh, and protesting mm. and because they don't like a decision that I make or they don't they don't think we're not moving fast enough. Uh, if nothing else, I want people to, to think of me that we did the right thing, uh, even if it was unpopular. Because you know what? Nine times out of 10, when time goes by, they say, okay, that's what she was doing. That's mm. what exactly what happened with the, with the former mayor. People didn't understand what we did. Uh, people said, you know, it happened during election year for me. So it would, be, it would have been very easy for me not to prosecute the mayor and not to suffer the political flack and get reelected. Um, but when he was, when later on, when things happened and more things came, oh, okay, that's why she did what she did. And so, but I just want people to know that I did the right thing based on the evidence and based on the facts. And we weren't afraid to tackle um, the tough cases where we were going to be endlessly criticized for, or for years and years and years later. Um, but, and then I can look in the mirror and I can know that I represented the people of the county, all of the people, not just a certain segment, but every single citizen in Wayne County.